Hello. In this presentation, I'm going to look at the cost of equity, both from a calculation and a meaning perspective. Equity was introduced in the Sources of Finance presentation, and it may be beneficial to watch that presentation first if you've not already done so. Specifically, this presentation will cover what the cost of equity represents, methods for calculating the cost of equity, the dividend growth model, estimating growth, and the capital asset pricing model. Let's look at each of these in turn. What the cost of equity represents. The cost of equity is the return required in order to satisfy equity shareholders. As discussed in the Sources of Finance presentation, dividends are not guaranteed, and neither is it certain that share prices will increase. Despite this, shareholders invest in the hope or expectation that one or both of these things will happen. Indeed, it is this variability or uncertainty in the outcome that is described as risk and given that the risk, i.e. variability, is high, the return required, and therefore the cost of the company, will also be high. Despite all of the above, even though a shareholder return is not guaranteed, companies still need to be aware of the return required to keep investors happy in order that they can allocate funds to appropriate projects. It is the estimation of the return required that we turn to now. Methods for calculating cost of equity. Broadly, there are two approaches to estimating the cost of equity. One, dividend growth model, and two, capital asset pricing model, or CAPM. I deliberately use the term estimate rather than calculate as there are drawbacks or weaknesses to both approaches. Accordingly, when considering the two approaches, it is important to consider the calculation itself, assumptions made, and weaknesses or drawbacks. Let's look at each approach in turn. The dividend growth model. The dividend growth model values a share as the present value of its future expected dividend stream. In other words, it assumes that when an investor is determining how much to pay for a share, they 1. Estimate the dividend stream, 2. Determine their required return, and 3. Discount the dividends at the required rate of return to arrive at the share price to be paid. Whether this actually is the thought process that investors go through can be challenged. However, using this process, if a company knows the share price and can estimate the dividend stream, they can calculate the discount rate applied, i.e. the return required by shareholders. This is represented by the following formulae. For preference shares, the cost of preference shares, KP, equals the dividend D divided by the current share price, P0. For equity shares, the cost of equity, KE, equals the dividend in one year's time, D1, divided by the share price now, P0, plus G, the percentage growth in dividends per annum, expressed as a decimal. D1 can also be shown as D0 multiplied by 1 plus G, the current dividend increased by a year's worth of growth. The slight difference between the formula for preference and equity shares is simply because the preference dividend is a fixed percentage and doesn't grow. The drawbacks of this approach are 1. The validity or otherwise of the underlying assumption of the investor's thought process discussed above. 
2. It can only be applied to companies whose shares are listed and regularly traded, i.e. they have an accurate share price. 3. It can only be applied to companies who pay a dividend. 4. It assumes that dividend growth rates are constant. And 5. It assumes that the dividend growth rate can be estimated. This last point is discussed further below. Estimating growth. As discussed in the Sources of Finance presentation, dividends are paid at the discretion of the directors based on their assessment of the company's finances at that point in time. Accordingly, nobody can accurately predict in advance the rate at which dividends will grow. Notwithstanding this fact, the dividend growth model requires an estimate to be made, and there are two mathematical approaches that may be adopted. One, based on historic rates. If the latest dividend paid is 50 pence, and recent dividends have been 45 pence, 42 pence, 40 pence and 39 pence four years ago, then the dividend has grown from 39 pence to 50 pence over the period. The average rate can then be estimated as the fourth root of 50 divided by 39, which gives 1.064. If you then subtract 1, you are left with 0.064, or 6.4%. It is assumed that this same rate of growth will continue moving forward, albeit this is another assumption whose validity can be questioned. 2. Growth is calculated as B multiplied by R, where B is the balance of earnings retained and R is the return earned. Imagine a company has assets of £100 and makes a return on those assets of 20%. In the first year, the company will earn a profit of £20, 20% 20 of £100. If the company decides to pay a dividend of £5, it will retain the other 15 and so the assets now invested are £115. Assuming the 20% return is maintained, the profit in year 2 will be £23, 20% 20 of £115. Comparing the £23 in year 2 to the £20 in year 1, this represents a growth rate of 15%. This growth is predicted by B multiplied by R as 75%, the proportion of the £20 profit retained, multiplied by 20%, the return earned, is 15%. Capital Asset Pricing Model CAPM links the return required by shareholders to the level of risk they face. It does not, however, consider all of the risks as described here. In simple terms, there are two types of risk faced by a company. One, unsystematic or specific risk, which are the risks linked specifically to a particular organisation. And two, systematic or market risk, which are the risk of being in the market. As a generalisation, when markets fall, all shares fall, and when markets rise, all shares rise. Unsystematic risk can be diversified away by holding a portfolio of investments. For example, if you hold shares in one company, and that company is involved in exporting to the USA, you are exposed, amongst other things, to an exchange rate risk. If you buy shares in a second company that imports from the USA, you are now exposed to the same risk but in the opposite direction. 
Accordingly, you are no longer exposed to exchange rate risk and so have reduced the overall risk. By holding more and more shares, individual or specific risks can gradually be reduced and it is estimated that you can largely eliminate unsystematic risk with a portfolio of around 15 to 20 shares. A first assumption of CAPM is that if you can diversify, you will, and therefore unsystematic risk can be ignored. Whilst this may be largely true for institutional investors who employ fund managers for that very reason, it is less appropriate for individual investors. CAPM then assesses the cost of equity by comparing the risk-free return, the return required from a risk-free investment, to the market return, the return required given the average market risk, and is given by the following formula. Cost of equity, KE, equals RF plus RM minus RF multiplied by the beta, where RF is the risk-free return and RM is the market return. Alternatively, RM minus RF is the market premium. Beta is a risk score assessed by comparing the historic volatility in a share price with the volatility in the market during the same period. A beta of 1 indicates that the company's risk is the same as the average market risk. A beta higher than 1 indicates a higher than average risk. A beta lower than 1 indicates a lower than average risk. The drawbacks of CAPM are It assumes that all investors hold diversified portfolios. It assumes that the historic risk relationship estimated by the beta holds true moving forward. It assumes that reliable figures for RF and RM can be established. In practice, the return on government stocks is often taken as an indicator of risk-free. Finally, it can be argued that having only one indicator of risk is too simplistic. Thank you.